Hello friends, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show. Este es mi episodio numero 579. Conmigo Agostino Zinga. How was that? Oh yeah! Big up man. Welcome back to the show and big up for my supporters and my contributors and my content commentators for giving me that little bit of a heads up when it comes to speaking the old spanglish that i'm most tempted to speak but regardless welcome back to the show it's great to have you back here once again hope you are well wherever you may be how am i doing okay i've got a little bit of a soreness in my elbow from all the gym stuff i've been doing some burpees here and there some overhead presses some kettlebell swings and i've got this little funny elbow thing but i think normally you know it's something you always get when you go to gym too much you get a little bit of a dodgy elbow just from you know usually poor form maybe letting go of something when you wasn't meant to let go of it maybe not bracing the right way you know tiny other things but i've got a little bit of an elbow thing going on here not too bad not too bad it's much better than having like carpal tunnel in it that's the thing that all gamers and streamers get right which is a bit cringe because you know when you get something like that that's when you know you spend way too much time indoors and way too much time holding a mouse on your keyboard and all that sort of stuff it kind of makes you feel like a bit of a loser like you feel immediately like a wings of redemption type person like a boogie type person isn't it you don't exactly see the most you don't have the vision of like a really you know, jacked and ripped person getting carpal tunnel. You always get the feeling it's always like neck beer types, which I'm sure isn't true. But this is the this is the lie we've been um, we've been fed because of the amount of losers out there with carpal tunnel. But regardless, my elbow's janky, but I'm still feeling good. I'm hydrated. I'm well. My water bottle's actually all the way over there, so I'm not gonna get it and shake it into the microphone. But you know what the vibes are. Get in the water a day. We're jacking it. I'm actually squeezing lemons into it now, but I gotta make sure I don't get all the stuff inside it because when I do, it kind of makes me gag a bit. I know it's only lemons, but just seeing stuff float around there makes me a little bit. Ugh. So I'm a bit of a baby that way. So I've got to cup it in my hands and squeeze it and let all the juices run in there. But it's absolutely perfect when it goes down. The only bad thing about it is that it makes you pee pee so hard and so frequently. And if you know anything about me, I'm not really the biggest fan of always going to the toilet. It pisses me off some, for, for lack of a better term or for, you know, no pun intended. I hate going to the toilet. You know, people really enjoy taking a number two, really enjoy having a leak. I don't. I don't know what it is. I just I don't enjoy going all the time. It's so annoying. But obviously, when you're on a somewhat healthy diet, the first thing you notice is that you are leaking all the time all the time and usually you have a pretty frequent stool so maybe you're you know maybe doing a number two i don't know twice a day sometimes if you're eating correctly because of all that fiber that's coming out of you but if you're not eating correctly you know you can miss a day here or there um so that's one thing i noticed it's a bit annoying but you know what it is what it is if that's all i have to complain about then i'm living a good life apart from that what's happened the end of the Premier League season, the end of the season overall, hippie, 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 Kaye. As a United supporter, I could not wait for this season to be over. It's been an absolutely monumental failure, but it's also been, weirdly enough, an eye-opening season for the majority of fans who've had their heads in the sand and maybe some pundits as well, and journalists, and all that sort of stuff, because it's exposed us, I think, for what we really, truly always have been, I think for fans like myself, we've always been plugged in and aware that the problems of our club weren't always down to managers or singular players, and more so an overall thing with the club, and how it's run, and the hierarchy, and the owners, and everything associated with it, I think this has finally been one of our it's, it's, it's been the it's, it's been what's it, what the people what do people say the term is like the chickens have come home to roost like finally finally we have ended up in a position in a league and a performance level that befits what we're actually playing like on the pitch because i think there's been plenty of seasons beforehand even you would say the 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 league title that van persie won us um you know single-handedly and maybe a couple of others where some people would say oh you know i didn't deserve to win the league and you know we won it anyway but the, and, and even you know going in recent times with, with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer finishing third and finishing second and all that stuff you look at and you're like did we really deserve to finish those positions not really and there were loads of mitigating circumstances around it and i think actual fans of the club knew that 
and I and I like that now has been the true awakening point in terms of where we actually are as a club. And I think even though we didn't finish, you know, outside the top ten, we're still in the top six. I feel like the performances have been so bad. It has clearly illustrated how far off we are from the likes of Liverpool and Man City, let alone the Chelsea's. You know what I mean, we we still have we still have a long way to go to catch up to Chelsea, who were way off of Liverpool and Man City. I think it was more like ten points or something that was separating the Chelsea's to the Man City's and Liverpool's. But we have a long way to go. But obviously that's not going to be sorted. With managers, anyway. That being said, the season was finally over. Today was the last game we faced Crystal Palace away from home, and some fans were still in the delusion that we were going to suddenly turn it on. Suddenly the players, because Eric ten Hag, our new manager, who we jacked from flipping Ajax was, stand, was sitting in the stands that somehow these players who have thrown every single manager under the bus as Roy Keane accurately pointed out and who have also been a catastrophic failure in all positions were suddenly going to wake up today and think you know what I'm going to play like I actually want to be at this club I'm going to play like this actually means something to me I'm going to play because my future depends on this performances no they didn't do that they pulled in a terrible performance maybe the second half will be worse than the first half and you end up losing against a pretty decent Crystal Palace side a Crystal Palace side also managed by Patrick Vieira who a lot of people had a lot of things to say about and who has clearly proved his critics wrong come in, stabilise the club, got some great loan signings in and generally made them play good football d despite the sum of their parts not being that great. Outside of a couple of players who maybe, you know, stand out like the Zahas and the Conor Gallagher, so of course they've gotten loan. The rest of the team is full of, you know, some mediocre players here and there, some good youngsters, but overall I think he has... I would say, overachieved with the level of players that he has. Some people would say, oh, if you won a couple more games, you could have maybe finished in European places, but I think that would have been a bit of a stretch. But he's still done a good job, so credit to Patrick Vieira and credit to everybody surrounded with Crystal Palace. They played really well. They dominated, I think, most of the crucial parts of the game, and we didn't really have a chance of scoring, let alone winning the game. Cool, whatever, we move on. The thing that's really interesting to come out of that store, out, out of that match, though, has been the light like, clockwork um, stories that have been fed to the media in order to try to explain why this season has been so terrible and to try to maybe lay blame at certain people's feet because that's what this club is. This club isn't a club for sporting success or trophies. This club is mainly a commercial entity. It's mainly an entity that exists for the Glazers to extract dividends out of the club because the funny thing is the Glazers own us but they don't actually put any money into the club. Whatever the club generates, they put that back into the club in order to pay for transfers but they don't do what other owners do where they take money out from their own pockets and put it into the club in order for us to be more successful no they take it out of the dividends all the time so the club is bleeding death of a thousand cuts even though we spent loads of money ill-advised on certain marquee players to shut up the crowd basically and shut up the you know the the flipping um, detractors and the people who want Glazers out. You look, you look at somebody like a Varane and a Sancho, both signed in the same window. It's during the same time that fans were, you know, threatening to go and strike and stuff. We know how to do those kind of big marquee signings, but overall, you wouldn't think this team or this squad or this club had, you know, spent a billion play, a billion, I think, dollar, I think a billion pounds more on players if you looked at the players that we had lining up against Crystal Palace which you actually look, check out the lineup again let me put that back on the screen so the team against Crystal Palace the absolute team that we played last game of the season included the following David Aguirre in goal Maguire and Lindelof at centre backs Alex Tellers at left back Dallo at right back Fred and McTominay playing as a double pivot F Bruno Fernandes playing as a 10 and the Roman 8 um, Hannibal M Majabi obviously a young player playing on the left wing Elanga another young player playing on the right and Edison Cavani the player who had been missing for the majority of the season we don't know where he obviously didn't want to be at the club after January probably threw his toys out of the pram but for whatever reason the club indulged him and he absolutely took the piss but somehow managed to pull up his socks and put his boots on and go and play for us at the last game of the season and he did absolutely nothing but those are the players that wouldn't really strike as a team that cost a billion dollars would you all right a billion pounds or whatever and then of course the first you know players to come off of the bench the first player to come off of the bench one matter a player who was signed under the david moyes regime so that says everything that you need to know about this club but along the, what i was going to say was that now the club is running interference and they've got all their paid shields and media correspondents out there doing their bidding by leaking all of this flipping information concerning the club and basically making it seem as if they're trying to lay the blame at certain players but 
What are some current comments I thought were really interested in terms of David De Gea, in terms of um, what he said about the new season, which I thought was very illuminating because it clearly shows that the players haven't been enjoying this season as much as we as fans haven't been enjoying watching them. Even though they've acted like they don't care, I feel like deep down, professional pride will take over. And the fact that they watch Liverpool and Man City have these amazing games head to head. They're obviously fighting for the league, fighting for the Champions League, and they're going two for nail. People are getting plodded, the players are getting plodded, and then Man United play, and it's always pointing at the finger of who's bad, who's crap, who needs to get sold, who's overrated. So clearly it's going to get to them. And David De Gea said this after the game, according to United District, who took the quote um, from a person called Shamoon Hafez. It says the following. I want to forget this season and be 100% ready for the next season and be positive. It has been horrible, a very bad season in all ways. It's been very tough. It's time to reset and prepare your minds for next season. Clearly not happy. One's, um, another, another comment for David De Gea. Ones who want to stay, stay at the club. Ones that don't want to go, don't want to stay, could go out. You don't have to stay here. Again, another dig at the players who are maybe throwing their toys at the pram, not really pushing for moves, clearly not happy or willing to take the contracts, but then complaining after the fact. Who knows? But it continues. The best thing that happened today is that the season is finished. <laughs> I love that. It continues. The new manager and staff are already looking for new players. Hopefully they bring good ones, right? Good players. But the, the end bit is a really important bit. He says good players with good character. So it's one thing saying good players because it's clear we need them. But the good character thing is, a, is the most important because what we've clearly seen <clears throat> with this United team has been a clear disconnect in terms of the feeling and the love that we have for them. There was a point in time, I think last season or a couple of seasons before, where Guy Neville said one time during Sky Sports News that he didn't, he hated his team. I think it was maybe when Lukaku was playing for us, which is, you know, ironic. But he said he hated his team and it's not, there's not you know, he doesn't have any warm affection for them because he felt like they were full of mercenaries. I don't think this team is full of mercenaries at the moment. I just think it's full of players who have been, who have been kind of overindulged. Players who are, who act like they're way above their playing ability. Players who haven't achieved anything in a game, talking as if they're like Ballon d'Or contenders or something. Absolutely incredible. And most of it has come because of they've been relied upon. They've been rewarded for for mediocrity and for failure. So they're now kind of believing their own hype. But I don't necessarily think they're bad people. That's the thing. I don't think they're bad people. I actually need to be put in that position. Good example being Harry Maguire. I don't think Harry Maguire is a bad person. I just think he's been indulged. He got signed for 80 million to play for Man United, one of the biggest clubs in the world. He got given the captain's armband almost immediately as he signed. England captain. Yeah, um, you know, that that's a big deal coming to United and being the captain there, especially being an England player, especially being a commanding centre back that he's trying to be. So so I wouldn't it's not surprising that he'd kind of believe his own hype and think he's, you know, God's gift to football and stuff. But I think if the club was serious, they'd put him, you know, they'd kind of put him in his place, tell him that, you know, there are no special favours here. We don't care if we sign you for 80 million. If you don't perform to the level that we want to do, don't do the things that we instruct you to do, you're going to be on the bench. And if you're not on the bench, you're going to be out of this club. Like any other top clubs does. But he doesn't, he gets indulged, which is why we got the monster we have now at the moment. Anyway, David Gea continues. I cannot wait to play under Eric Ten Hag. I'm excited for next season. New manager, new players. Again, he says that. Hopefully we improve and put Man United in a better position. We need to trust in the future. So clearly, like, this is... Forget this. Line in the sand. Let's continue. He continues. No, it's another quote from Ragnick um, talking about Ten Hag. No, he did not come in the dressing room. It would be unusual. He has not been introduced to the team yet. Ragnick said of Crystal Palace goal. The goal scorer in the end was Zaha, but the ones who gave the assist were ourselves. Of course, because guess who? Bruno Fernandes, no look pass into the defender's hospital ball, immediately puts Zaha, so immediately puts Dello on the back foot, who already was having a torrid time against Zaha. Zaha picks it up, runs at him, does what he does best. Lindelof tries to help, but Lindelof, we already know he's really afraid of black aggressive strikers. He gets scared, he's dancing on ice, Dello's dancing on ice, and then, you know, Zaha does what Zaha does, cuts back, and basically puts in a bottom corner, and Bob's your uncle, Granny's your aunt. So that was one of the quotes. Then you fast forward. I thought another one of this was, was from David Gay was interesting here. He says, the level we have shown in the last three or four months isn't enough to win a Premier League match. We were all, we were sloppy. We lost some easy balls around the box. It's impossible to win the games. I just want to be positive. Forget about this season. The, mini, the new manager was in the stands, so that's a good signal. I hope things will get better for next season. That's the past already. We all know it's been a bad season for everyone. 
the people who don't want to stay just go and the people who really want to stay at the club who want to fight for the club let's have a good reset in the summer prepare ourselves in the mind and body and be ready to fight again next season I believe it's going to be much better under Ten Hag I trust the new manager da, 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 da. Um, okay da, da, da. okay so yeah the blame game this is the blame game that I thought was interesting number one the Ragnick quote this is taken from The Athletic, an article written by Laurie Whithall. It says the following. Ragnick asks internally why May United hadn't planned for the expected departure of Matic by signing a defensive midfielder ahead of time. He questioned why in 2020, some 90 million had been sent on Ahmad, Pelestri and Van der Beek than a guaranteed first team starter. So already they're trying to blame players who don't even play for the club. They're all on loan, with the ex exception of Palestri, I think. Is he not on loan? Is he at the club? No, they're all on loan, sorry. Every, all three of them are on loan at the moment. I don't, not sure where Palestri is at. Amma's at Rangers and Van der Beek's at Everton. He scored their only goal against um, Arsenal today where they lost, I think, 5-1 or something. So they're all on loan and they're all players who the previous manager was also not fond of for whatever reason. Cool, or didn't trust. Just trusting these main players and ended up letting him down. He ends up getting fired. But, they're also putting this weird onus on Matic as if he was an integral member of the squad too. He was never has been. He never has been really given a run in the team. Um, he was maybe overlooked if you think about some fans such as Ricky and stuff who loved Matic. But there was never any thinking, like Man United fans have been crying out, myself included, for a defensive midfielder. We never got one for years. I don't know why, but we never had one. So to sit there and suddenly say Matic is the reason why we're not successful is weird. To blame players that aren't even at the club is also weird, but it continues. Let's, let's keep on going because this is an absolute horror show. This is a, another quote from the article. Summer Carrington felt Ragni became more focused on the wider landscape than results on the pitch. Man United staff tried to steer him in the right direction on coaching, but having worked as sporting director and manager, he felt the task could, couldn't be neatly separated. So clearly, the club are trying to brief the press to let them know that they feel as if Ragnick's attention was diverted, like he was distracted by all the stuff happening in the club and he wasn't focusing on coaching the players. But the issue that we had from the very beginning, us fans from the outside looking in, was that Ragnick was brought in as some sort of like gegen press maestro, a person who clearly has got the acumen, the knowledge and the ability to coach players to play a certain type of football. A person who managers like Klopp and Tuchel have credited for their start and for where they are in their career. So he clearly has got the chop and there's evidence to prove it but when he came to the club they wouldn't let him get his own coaches in he had to make do with the coaches that they were available the person who interviewed him in Darren Fletcher was suddenly sitting next to him in the, in, in the coaching area there was no fitness coach to come in and you know brief you know and get the players up to a level in order to play that pressing football which probably still wouldn't happen anyway in six months but that never happened we only saw that pressing gig and press thing for one half some would argue 35 minutes against Crystal Palace at home that's the only time we saw us play that kind of football that we that we had seen already in the YouTube clips and that we saw Ragnick talk about in his conference and after games and podcasts and stuff we saw it for one half of football because the club wouldn't let him get his own coaches in to play the kind to push these play, players outside their comfort zone and guess what happened the first few weeks that Ragnar was here at the club anyway the league started coming out the training's too hard he wants us to come in in the evening we have to see our kids all this nonsense stuff came in so now they're trying to blame it on him and say that he was distracted but the interesting thing about this this sounds oddly familiar to what Rio Ferdinand said in his show the other day. Remember that disgraceful comment that Rio Ferdinand came out about, oh, if I was at United, I would tell him to be quiet. I would not tell him to come out and air out their laundry in the public. He needs to focus on the team. The team is as important. Like, what are you talking about? He's literally making excuses for the Glazers. That's what he's basically doing because what the Glazers have done, the mismanagement of this football club, the absolutely um, terrible way that they've kind of steered us to the direction that we're in now is the reason why we are where we're at. And unless the Glazers leave, I've said it already, categorically, categorically, we can win trophies. Trophies are, not say easy, but trophies are, a, you're capable of winning trophies even if you're not a good team because trophies are cup competitions one of games if you have decent players and all right coaches on the day anyone could beat anybody so you can win a trophy trophies are possible to win FA Cup League Cup Champions League as long as Champions, Champions League is far-fetched but you know what I mean but I'm saying this categorically we will never win a Premier League title again with the Glazers as owners never the only way we're winning a Premier League title with the Glazers' owners is if we suddenly find a coach who is Alex Ferguson reincarnated. So all you fans out there who are hoping he's going to be the guy, you have to pray, pray to whoever God you, you pray to, 
that that somehow Eric Ten Hag, this manager who you, most of you guys never knew who he was prior to him being at Ajax anyway, somehow is Alex Ferguson reincarnated. You have to hope that he is a better coach than Pep, than Klopp, than Tuchel, than Conte with money. Then whoever comes in after Sean, the, the, whoever comes in after what's his face at Newcastle with money, you have to hope he's going to be better than all those coaches in the league. Plus all the other coaches in the league who do great stuff, like the Graham Potters and stuff, and with Brighton who can take points off you, like the guy at Wolves who can take points off you. There are great coaches in this league, but you have to hope that Eric Ten Hag is re Eric Eric flipping um sorry Sir Alex Ferguson reincarnated in order for us to win the league, because they're intrinsically linked. The reason why we're at now at the moment is the Glazers. The moment the Glazers took control of that club, we have never been the same, sporting-wise. It was only the genius of Sir Ferguson that allowed us to win Premier League titles. Without him, we would have been in the doldrums. And it got proved, because the moment he stepped away from the club, the club imploded into itself. And every manager after the fact has been a categoric failure. Even the ones who have won trophies have failed. They've all been fired. Failed, 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 failed. So unless we change ownership, we're never going to be successful again. Never. And the fact that the club are trying to separate what goes on in the boardroom from what happens on the pitch is disgusting because we all know it's linked. We all know the reason why we're at where we're at the moment is because of the boardroom. Eric Ten Hag, before he even started in the role, he's already got one hand behind his back because Bruno Fernandes was given a new contract. Why would the club give Bruno Fernandes a new contract knowing what we've done prior and where we're trying to go? Why would you give him a new contract? What's the rush? He's not going to go anywhere. He's not going to go anywhere better than Man United anyway in his, in his current market. No one's probably going to pay what we paid for him anyway. So why are you giving him a new contract? Why not let him play for his role, actually let him, sorry, play for his new contract, actually let him impress a new manager and then reward him for the contract off of that basis. But we don't. We give him a new contract. Why? Because the club sees players as assets. That's what they bump up the stock market price in. So if you've got the players tied down, especially if they're worth a lot of money, it can increase the value of the company. So again, it's all money. It's not to do with sports. It's all money. It's not to do with trophies. It's all money. It's absolutely disgusting. Continuing, the other quote that was really disgusting was this one. Um, oh no, the, the, another quote from Ragnik, which I thought was interesting too, uh, regarding Ragnik. Ragnik wondered why various players have been given lucrative contracts and was told the deals were a reward for playing well, which they aren't playing well. Fletcher referred to upstairs. And it was strategy implemented by Woodward, Judge, and endorsed by Joe Glazer to protect the book value. Now, I think this is a planted thing. They always throw in a bit of, like, bait to make the Glazers look bad. But in general, these are just, like, nothing stories that no one, that no real fan, I don't think no real fan, that most fans probably don't even care about or wonder. But I think if you want to throw out some catnip in there to get people to, like, oh, see, like, this journalist is legit. That's what you throw in there. So I think these are planted stories to make them look bad, but they don't really do anything to further anything. We continue. Um, oh, the one, no, I wanted to see the one about fucking Bai. Is that on there? We don't get that one there. Oh, anyway, there was a quote about Bai where basically they made it seem as if because Eric Bai was at the AFCONs or because Eric Bai was allegedly saying stuff about Maguire and other players at the club, that he was maybe the reason for it, that why we're at where we're at, which again, I think is just disgusting of the club overall. Um, but yeah, good luck to Eric Ten Hag. He was already at the stadium. Um, he clearly saw you know, what, how, what, how different it is to manage a club like United. I think there was some um, Sky Sports News, um, you know, reporter trying to get his attention and one of the flipping guards had to push him away and he was talking some absolute wass. Let me see if I can actually get it up on the thing. So clearly he's seeing the attention and the scrutiny he's going to be under being a, a Man United manager is probably tenfold of what he got at Ajax. And especially from the press, don't be surprised to hear Gary Neville all of a sudden be incredibly critical about selection, about tactics, about formations and all this stuff concerning this United manager because he's not Ole Gunnar Solskjaer because he was quiet as a mouse when Solskjaer was in charge. Absolutely quiet because his friend was in charge who was a hopeless manager, a manager who probably can't even get a job in the Premier League again to save his life. Hopelessly, hopelessly still at the club. We should have fired him a long time ago and he didn't say nothing because why? He wanted to protect his own interests, of course, associated with um, the Glazers because I still think people like that are in their pockets and of course support his friend. But in the end, he ended up kind of, you know, shooting him in the foot. But yeah, here's a clip of uh, Eric Ten Hag trying to run away from the from the press who are clearly trying to get some sound bites. Welcome to the Premier League, Eric. No, no, no. Are you excited to get started? Welcome to the Premier League. Are you excited to get started? You must be wanting to get stuck in straight away. Don't push me. You're on television. Doesn't look good. Doesn't look good, bit manhandled by security, Eric. Man United, a big club. 
<laughs> so good. Mine at a big club. Fuck off, you cunt. But anyway, that's what happened there. Next, we want to quickly move on to this news, courtesy of Sky Sports News. Killing Mbappe. PSG forward signs a new contract with League on Champions, but Le Liga is set to file a complaint, which is hilarious. But the the transfer news, second only maybe to Haaland. Haaland was, you know, the one everyone was waiting for. Where's Haaland going to go after Dortmund? He then decided to go to Man City. And if you believe the stories out there, he actually rejected Real Madrid. So Real Madrid were, uh, were not only trying to sign Haaland, they were also trying to sign Mbappe in the same window. The same Real Madrid who have already won the league. No, sorry, won the yet. Who have already won the league, right? They're on course to maybe, hopefully, win the Champions League. I hope they do against Liverpool, and they're still going to sign, they still wanted to sign, sorry, Kylian Mbappe and Haaland. That goes to show you the levels that we're trying to operate at, Man United, how far away we are from these clubs. We didn't sign anybody in January. We we were okay with the club and squad that we had, thinking we were going to get top four by just getting Ralph Ragnick in, who hadn't managed a club in however many years, and with all the limitations that surround him in terms of the structure and the players he has available and the pressures of playing certain people. Man, anyway, we continue. So Mbappe is now signed for, re-signed for PSG. First of all, as a fan of football, it's pretty underwhelming. He is one of the hottest talents in world football, an incredibly exciting striker to watch. Some people would say he's a bit of a one-trick pony and that he only has pace. But I think in the last couple of years, he's really improved his all-round game. The way he can stretch the pitch, playing on the wings, his assist, um, his, close, his close touch and control. Like, I think those are things he's really improved over the years and could be improved as he keeps progressing, hopefully with better coaches coming into clubs at PSG. But we would like to see players like this test themselves on the highest level in different leagues and different competitions. This is why I think people like Cristiano Ronaldo should be put, small credit should be put on his name. And as much as people would say, you know, if you want to pick between Messi and Ronaldo, maybe I would always go for Messi because he's the most naturally gifted player people have seen in a very long time. And he clearly makes, you know, football look just amazing when he's playing it, especially at the speed that he's playing it at. But in terms of somebody who has, you know, I would say, created themselves in the same in the same vein as like a, this is a bad example, but in the same vein as like a Frank Lampard, right, who started off somebody being, you know, ridiculed for being fat Frank, somebody who everyone thought he was only in the West Ham team because of nepotism. And then he suddenly progressed and trained himself and honed his craft into being the player that he ended up being at Chelsea. And then for a little spell at Man City, which is, you know, heinous to say the least, but yeah, we continue. Ronaldo did the same thing, created himself into being the, one of the world's best players in the world. Ballon d'Or winning player, you know what I mean? Great player. Broken all these goal-scoring records. But one of the main things I think that separates Ronaldo from some of his peers, especially Messi included, is that at the height of his, uh, uh, of his powers at Man, Man United, I would say the best version of Ronaldo was obviously at Man United, especially him playing on the wings, playing centre forward, you know, playing as an attacking midfielder, whatever he was doing was incredible to see. But he went and tested himself in Real Madrid, in Juventus, and then back again to Man United, like at the highest level. And every time people would criticise him or would ask questions of him, if he's too old, whatever it may be, he always delivered. And I think overall, it's probably made him a better player, maybe extended his career longer than probably it would have if he stayed at one league in one competition. The fact that he's been able to go to different countries, have different demands on his body, different demands on his football acumen, this is all important. And I think to see Kylian Mbappe just waste, I think, his best years at PSG is a bit lame because we've all watched Ligue 1. Ligue 1 isn't a great league. It might be fast, it might be physical, but quality-wise, it's nowhere near the other top leagues in Europe. So even though he might get some good games out of Lille, he might get some good games out of Marseille, he might get some good games out of flipping um, Olympic Lyon, like there might be some good games here and there, but for the majority of the time, they're going to be whitewashing the entire league, flat track bully style. So, I mean, it's a bit of a shame that way. But on the other end, as a professional, it's an incredible deal, according to Sport Bible. Kylian Mbappe's reported contract to PSG. He's getting a 300 million euro signing bonus. So already, you know why he signed there. If you believe the reports online, though, they tell you that the Madrid offer was exactly the same, almost identical. So maybe some things were, numbers were maybe lower here and there, but around the same ballpark. 
So if I if it was me, I would say Kylian Mbappe being the marquee player that he is, the fact that he's bilingual, speaks English, um, speaks French. I'm pr pretty sure he probably got a bit of Spanish and Italian in him too. In him too. He's got the look. He's got all the sponsors. He scores these great goals. He plays for PSG. He's not going to ever be lacking for money, in my opinion. So it really wouldn't be a money decision. I would think so. But then when you're talking about 300 million signing on bonus, that's the kind of money that's going to set up your generation, 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 generation of children for life, especially if you invest it the right way. That is life, that is kind of generational altering money. So that makes sense in that regard. If you picked it basically on my, if your decision was made solely based on money alone, 300 million signing on bonus makes sense. Then on top of that, his salary is 100 million euros a year after tax, which again is insane because that would mean the weekly wage is going to be something nuts, right? Maybe a million a week or whatever, something crazy. But then the other three points I think are incredibly incredibly redacted and would probably end up shooting PSG in the foot and blowing up in their face. Number one, he will help decide the coach. Number two, he will have a say on the sporting director. And then number three, he can approve signing and sales. An absolutely insane decision to put that much power in a player. It's insane, especially for stuff that happens around the coaching style of stuff and stuff that happens in the boardroom level. It doesn't make any sense. Player power is already something that a lot of clubs have to really su are, are struggling with, especially for the players that earn a lot of money and break the wage structure and have very influential agents who maybe air your laundry out in public and make you look a certain way and blah, 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 blah. blah. Surely putting this much power in the hands of such a young player who I think has an overinflated sense of ego, in my opinion, but that remains to be seen. And I think he kind of, you know, uses this kind of humble personality thing. But I think deep down he's a bit of a savage. I think it's absolutely insane. And I don't think you would ever see that happening in any other club, in any other league in the world. No matter who the player is. Even if it was Messi playing for them, you would never give them this much power off the pitch. It doesn't make any sense. They're a good player, don't get me wrong. But what does Kylian Mbappe know about coaching? What does Kylian Mbappe know about sporting directors? What does Kylian Mbappe know about signing and sales? Unless behind the scenes, he's an absolute savant. He's an absolute boy wonder genius level of understanding the game to the extent where people were saying when he was like 12, oh my God, he's going to be an amazing manager. He's going to be an amazing sporting director. Maybe, I don't really know. But we haven't heard that coming out. That hasn't been a thing that we've heard about Mbappe. We just heard that, you know, he's a cool, humble guy behind the scenes. He's really fast and he scores loads of goals. But we've never heard anything about him being this maverick when it comes to coaching and, you know, being a sporting director and hiring and, you know, selling and, and signing off players. That is legitimately insane. But again, it could also explain why he's set at the club. Playing for your hometown club, a city you was born in, um, for a team that you feel like can only get better, for a club that also will most likely sack Poch if he doesn't deliver next season anyway and get whoever the best manager is available at the time. So don't be surprised if somebody like a Pep ends up at Man City, at PSG, long-term goal. So all these things are probably playing into it, but as a fan of football, I would have really loved to have seen him play. Really love to have seen him play in La Liga. Really love to have seen him play in any other league apart from France. Just to see him test himself and develop as a player going forward. Because I really think it would have improved him far better than staying at a club like PSG, being a flat track bully and doing what really? Putting up numbers in a league that no one really cares about. And also playing against players who aren't necessarily going to challenge you or make you evolve into the player that you need to be. And who knows? Maybe the fact that the competition is so poor in, in league uh, might attribute to why PSG always kind of falter at the final hurdle you know in the Champions League maybe playing all those good teams in succession just takes it out of the players because they're never used to playing against that level of quality or maybe it's just you know a luck thing because you know they were in the final just last year so you know one a couple of goals here and there and they've got Champions League under the belt but that's not the case but yeah I thought it was an incredibly insane deal incredibly insane situation all around but I guess for Kylian Mbappe it's absolutely congratulations to him because wow what an absolute deal he's got there what an absolute deal moving on moving on moving on what else we going to talk about here oh yeah cool let's talk about this quickly so the other day i went to where did i go i was out and about yeah i went to hackney i went for a little bike ride you know i've got my new bike now 
um I, i'll go out for rides and stuff and listen to new music and put albums on full blast not one ear not one headphone out doing a damn thing obviously it's just a single speed i'm actually going to switch it to a fixed um the other next uh, well yeah soon actually when i go and get it repaired i'm going to switch it to a fixed and then have it that way but i'm riding you know what i mean i'm riding dirty i'm doing a damn thing i was having a good time enjoying myself out there and i happened to be near hackney central about to go cross the road in order to go to the train station, right? Because at that time, unfortunately, I had, a, I had a puncture, so I couldn't ride my bike home. So I had to jump on the overground to go home. And I was waiting at the traffic lights to cross over to go to Hackett Central Station. I saw this, a really amazing, cool-looking dude rap, jump up or pull up to the, to the traffic lights in something that you don't see too often in London, right? And it was a chopper. Right, a chopper motorbike, something that I'm only familiar with after watching Sons of Anarchy and having that time period after Sons of Anarchy where, like most guys, I think out there, or gals as well, where you are super interested in balls deep with motorbikes and cafe races and choppers and all that sort of malarkey. I was looking at so many, I remember there was actually a blog spot, I forgot the name of it, it had these amazing, really cool black and white pictures. If anybody knows the name of it, please put a link down below. And I think the guy, you know, he's got like friends around the place, he takes these really amazing SLR pictures of his friends riding these amazing bikes all across america going to fairs picking up stuff in vintage shops like a really cool blog but anyway i was balls deep in it balls deep in that balls deep in biker gangs just checking out all the stuff so the reason why i even know what a chopper is and can kind of spot it and know what a narrow head chopper is in terms of the bars and that's what this this guy pulled up in he put up in a chopper with a narrow head which is basically like really narrow handlebars which i'm guessing i would improve the uh maneuverability and mobility of a bike i'll assume um but it looks amazing, right? Pulls up this amazing long chopper, massive bars, the super, super narrow handlebars. And then guess what he was wearing? He was also wearing these Supreme and Dr. Martin boots or these new shoes that they put out, right? From the, uh, the 1461, I'm thinking, right? is that what it is? I'm pretty sure I worked at Dr. Martin's. I should know this before. Is it 1461? It's free. Is it? Does it say the model? No, it doesn't say the model. Okay, they just say here on the news bit that Supreme has worked with Dr. Martin's on a new version of the Free Eye shoe, which I'm pretty sure is a 1461. It should be. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's different because it's got a thinner sole and pointed the front. Regardless, Supreme put out a, a Dr. Martin's collaboration recently which I saw on the news and, you know, on my email blast when Supreme emails come through. And I wasn't that impressed. Don't get me wrong. The lifestyle shots are pretty decent because they've always been pretty great. In the last few years, Supreme's lifestyle shots have really improved um, in terms of like want, making you want the things. But overall, the design was a bit over, uh, underwhelming. Essentially, it's a free lace kind of derby boot with a spider kind of eyelet motif. Oh, it's not eyelet, actually. It's stitched. Okay, my bad. At first, I thought it was um, the dots that you get, the perforations from like an Air Force One done in the spider. But actually, when you zoom in, it's actually a stitch done of a spider web on the toe box. And then they've got an all black um, midsole and outsole. There's no white foxing strip around it. All black laces with some nice premium sort of leather on the upper but just classic smooth leather nothing too crazy right and everyone's wearing them in the shoots the funny thing about this having worked in dr martin's and actually worn dr martin's for a very long period in my life they aren't that comfortable as models make them seem out in the shoots whenever they put them on you always feel like they're making them look like they're air force ones or wallabies but they're not at all they're really uncomfortable they hurt your feet they make you bleed but after you get through that period they become absolute plimsolls because every nook and cranny of your foot gets embedded and burned into that leather over a period of time but when when you first get them is hell on earth and then of course the black ones with the stitch as well which i think is what the guy was wearing um black with the white stitching and also what's not what you have a colorway here so it's black and red only okay i didn't know is it only black and red okay interesting colorways but anyway pretty nice oh no he actually that's it he's wearing the whites i'm pretty sure he had the white pair on he had the white ones with the with the with the what you call it with the spider web and the toe box so initially i saw these on my email blast and i thought this is a bit crap they're a bit underwhelming didn't really make too much off of it then I saw this guy wearing them with his chopper looking amazing. And guess what he was also wearing? He was also wearing this Supreme Fresher uh, bomber jacket, right? I think it's like, yeah, is it bomber? This jacket, another jacket that I didn't really care for when it came out, I think in like 2021 or something like that, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 2020. This Supreme Fresher collaboration, right? It's like a satin jacket that came out. Oh no, 2027, sorry, 2021, long ago. So he was wearing this jacket. So I'm pretty sure this guy's definitely connected with Supreme in some way, shape or form because he had a Dr. Martin boots on the day they were released in the middle of the day before they even released in the shops. And he definitely had one of these jackets on. So probably someone associated with the, with the crew or with the team. And immediately... 
him having this jacket on and those flipping white uh supreme you know free eye shoes immediately made them made me want them and it kind of goes back to what i've said plenty of times here on this podcast that i don't know why most brands or more brands don't do more lifestyle type things in terms of shoots and stuff that aren't just a typical thing of like some model jumping in the air doing the whole toe thing wearing pin rolls the foot in the water and all this sort of nonsense or just really poorly laced shoes you know taken in a while on a white backdrop no actually give it to people and actually let them use it in situ and i think that's one of the things that you have to give supreme credit for i think even their vans i forgot what collection it was a few maybe a few ones before they had a couple of models wearing the vans that they had collaborations with and they were clearly worn clearly these skaters or people that skate for the supreme team had clearly worn these for a period of time before they did the shoot and they were still doing the shoot with the shoes on so it gave you an idea of what the shoe looks like once it gets to wearing them but it actually made you want them because you immediately are like oh that kid's cool i want to be cool too so i'm going to buy those shoes which is essentially what i saw when that when that guy pulled up to the traffic lights on his chopper wearing a satin jacket that i didn't care for right the last satin jacket that i cared for for supreme was the one that i actually sold satin because it was fake unfortunately I, I, I didn't know but i used to buy a real one of them but they're really expensive rose's jacket i should have known them anyway but the pace one thing to know if you got if you accidentally buy fake stuff you can buy fake stuff if you want, but obviously no, it's fake. But if you don't want to buy fake, if you want to buy real stuff, a good a good rule of thumb is if it's under the you know the general retail price that everyone is selling it for, it's probably fake. And I thought I, I had a bug, and I thought I found something. I thought I kind of like you know did, did something that no one else did, and obviously it proved that to be fake. But this is a jacket that I, I had before, but my one was obviously not as good quality as this. But the last satin jacket I wanted for Supreme that was of that level. So the last satin jacket that I liked was this from 2013, right? This jacket, obviously, in that color was absolutely godly. Um, I actually think I wanted both at the time, but I ended up choosing the navy one just because, you know, it looks so swaggy and sexy, you know, back in the day. Look at the weekend dropping it. But yeah, it's a really, really nice jacket, right? And that's the last one I wanted. And I saw the fresher one because, you know, Supreme do loads of stuff with fresher every, mostly it feels like every season, similar to like Carhartt. And I didn't really think too much of it. Then you see someone pulling up to traffic lights on the chopper, wearing one of these satin jackets, and you're like, wow, I need this straight away and i wish more brands would take that and use kind of you know friends in their little you know usually if you're a brand usually you know you've got cool friends you're trying to create a world anyway that you might even have an avatar of the customer that you want to attract why not go out there and actually commission some pictures from people who are actually living a life and doing cool things and get them to take the pictures because they actually make stuff look cooler because for whatever reason i didn't actually like these when they were taken you know even though the, the picture's quite good and you know everyone's wearing them is obviously quite cool looking but you now you see it in real life you're like whoa this kid's on a chopper wearing those flipping white dr martin's looking absolutely amazing and then instantly i want them so that's just why i wanted to point out more brands need to start doing more lifestyle shots with people who actually are cool in real life as opposed to people on the internet and as opposed to doing those tippy toe nonsense sneaker and footwear shots that i absolutely hate anyway we continue we move on next shoe that i thought i wanted to give a lot of props to and highlight and something that i think some people have paid attention to some people haven't but i think considering the amount of attention that i paid to those tiger um mischief monstrosities i should also place some respect and some honor and some light on some vans collaborations that i think do a much better job than what those mischief tiger monstrosities were trying to do and it's these vault by vans by a guy called imran potato who i've seen some stuff online about you know instagram or whatnot but in terms of getting to the next level in terms of collaboration this will probably be the thing that ends up kind of blowing him up to the general public outside of the cool kids on instagram who know who to follow and whatnot i think these vans this old school iteration that he's done is legitimately one of the best looking shoes i've seen from vans in a long time maybe up there with the jammed collaborations of vans especially the first batch of them because i think that colorway that he put together the fact that they were uh, made in that in that old box um with the old box the old hand tag the colorways the simplicity of it this i think was one of the best collaborations they've done in a long 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 time vans vault right absolutely beautiful the skate mids again i'm not really a fan of the model i think they look pretty crap i've never really been a fan of the whole skater thing that they do where they get skate highs and they cut them into mids i've always thought they were absolutely horrible looking um i know some i know if i'm not mistaken that might have been the actual inspiration behind the half caps if i'm not mistaken if i've not got my 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 footwear history wrong there but regards i've always thought they looked a bit crap and cheap but the collaboration that he did jound with these 
um, skate mids were absolutely awesome. I thought they came out really, really well. All three of these shoes are instant cops and you can obviously tell by the resale price that these were something that, again, resale price shouldn't always be an indicator, but sometimes it, when it comes to stuff like Vans, you can tell people, it's like my Tom Sachs Mars Yards. I love the shoe. I wear them in the gym. I've worn them for many, many years. I'm probably going to get another pair soon. I don't care how much it costs. I'll get another one and just put them on ice. But, you know, resale price can also tell you that actual people wear them because there's not many available. So that's why the resale price is maybe overinflated. And these Vans and Jowns are crazy resale price on StockX. So these are probably the last great Vans collaborations that I've seen in recent years. Unfortunately, Supreme have stopped doing interesting ones with Vans. I thought the old ones that they did that I had before with the chuckers, with the color blocks and stuff were awesome but they've gone, they've gone to crap over time. But I honestly do think these Imran Potato Head Vans are legitimately one of the best things I've seen in a long time. These old schools, great. So if you're not seeing the picture, they essentially look like uh, an inflated old school with a really fat, whatever that mark is, a swoosh, a strike, whatever on the side of the shoe. They've got really fat laces. They've got a fat tongue. They've got a fat collar in terms of they've been a bit expanded and the toe box looks a little bit stretched too. So essentially they look like um, a Vans version of a, D, of a D3, of an Osiris shoe, you know those classic skate shoes. But also what I think what this might have, what they might have done for this, this looks like something that was built off of the Vans uh, Rowley, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's it, right? Vans Rowley. Uh, Rowley Pro. It's a bit fat as well, if I'm not mistaken, because it comes in, yeah, that's it. It comes in blue, um it comes in black too classic colorways but it, it kind of reminds me of these the imran potato heads in terms of the thickness and the fatness because i'm not sure if they absolutely let him retool an entire vans model i'm not sure if that's something they would do um given you know his profile given the collaboration given it's the first time I'm, I'm not too sure if that would be the thing that he would have clout over or, or control over in terms of doing his own shoe from the ground up all the way through i well i think it may be just as a something they built off of a rowley in, already which is already a shoe they already have in line at vans that obviously jeff rowley the skater designed um but i think these do a really good job in terms of kind of building on top of that great design of a shoe because i've always thought the rally was a severely underrated vans in terms of people who are fans of old schools or maybe um uh, what's the other one authentics and whatnot and eras that kind of low profile shoe is definitely something i think you should take an eye on with obviously the rallies but obviously the imran potato head ones look absolutely amazing really really amazingly done you've got another one with like a cheetah print colorway too that look really great then you've got another one with a more of a what do you call that a leopard skin print they're going on and obviously you've got the switch there with the white laces the white laces are obviously the game changer even with the all black ones you have to put the white laces in there they look amazing then you've got some really great iteration of a skate high i would have liked to have seen the skate high done in the same style as the old school though maybe a bit more fatter looking one of the things i hate about skate highs is that they look quite good and solid when you first get them and after a few wears they tend to kind of flatten out and get a little bit which is probably why a lot of people love the Converse 70s. Because the Converse 70s, especially the vintage ones, they have an ability to keep their shape and their form pretty well. Especially for someone like myself, who I don't necessarily think I look too great in Vans or in, sorry, um, in Converse's because I've got really wide feet and I'm not generally a kind of thin looking guy from the side profile. I don't think they look, again, maybe it's my own complex, but I don't think they look that great. But I think Converse's do a good job of kind of being the in-between of that sort of thing in terms of having that kind of look. And I would have liked to have a little bit more attention put on that with these Imran Potato Head skate highs. But still, I love the application of it. You've got this amazing illustration of a hand on the side of the shoe, um, illustrated, and it's also kind of uh, bleeding into the tongue itself i love the lacing as well by the way good little thing um this is something that i've always kind of had a real big pet peeve of mine when it comes to sneaker photography i hate it when nike take a shoe out from the box and just take pictures of it like sitting on a table it pisses me off like especially when they limited edition shoes take the time to relay like it's interesting because when I, when I was working for nike at the store 1948 rip in shoreditch back in the day or even when i used to work in other shoe stores like dr martin's or anywhere else that i had before like an office or offspring for a short period of time that you always had to relay shoes that was a common thing you had to do spacing on the rails for sh for clothes uh, sometimes one finger two finger depending on who your manager is depending on how much stuff you were selling and you always had to relay shoes so you take the shoes the, the shoe the shoelaces off and you'd relace them so that the 
so that the basically the laces were like over under instead of under over right whatever it may be but it's something that if you care about sneakers you know if you don't care you won't know but i also think overall in terms of the presentation of a shoe it really helps to give it a little bit of character and to give it a little bit of form and give people an idea of what it looked like when they put it on their feet so it increases sales for every reason even though I think the majority of people, like myself included, we see all our images of sneakers online. You don't get to see them in a store like we did in previous years because, you know, stores don't sell cool stuff anymore. All the accounts that were there that were selling great stuff have died and gone in other directions. Some of them are completely died and aren't around anymore. Now stores, if they are selling cool stuff, they have to sell loads of other crappy stuff. So to find the cool stuff is really difficult, especially for the cool stuff because it's limited and everyone wants it. So you won't even see it in store. So you're always seeing it in this 2D flat form all the time. So why not make it look more appealing by just, you know, removing the laces, relacing it and making it look like how you'd want to look, how you ideally like the models or the people to wear them, like your ideal version. And that's what they've done with how they've laced it, especially how they laced the skates with the laces just hanging out that way. And then with the skate highs, they've got this low four lace thing, which I've never seen someone wear in real life, to be honest. Really interesting way of doing a skate high, which has done a bit of a road kind of, you know, bit of a road looking way of doing it but i really like it honestly it's done in a really really cool way even the colorways they picked for the skate highs are nice they've got the classic checkerboard the blue colorway and then the all blacks really done in an incredibly good way from what i've seen online every single model is sold out which is again adamant or testament to how popular this oh they come with blue laces too they, oh i'm gonna try to get them a resale they come with blue laces too they look so good the old schools with the blue laces they look great oh yeah he did yeah that's it isn't it remember potato head did the did those shoes that look like feet too the rubberized ones that are really cool I'd, I'd actually love to get a pair of those actually just to kind of fuck around in but they look so absolutely cool they've got the foot there at the bottom which i'm assuming is maybe his signature that he does the cheetah print ones look amazing with the white socks and the denim with the denim shorts you've got a pair of the black ones again with the blue laces which i'm obviously gonna get oh man i would love to get a pair of these oh amazing amazing you got us pizza here in the swimming pool wearing them underwater so check in you know they're clearly waterproof for reasons there's a jacuzzi cooling out doing this thing i've actually got an interesting story about Al's pizza back in the day when i was working for this um major art supply conglomerate one of the first people i reached out to, to about being an influencer and giving him materials to do his work on and stuff was Al's pizza i actually sent him a whole box of stuff he never actually ended up shouting us out and stuff whatever but end up, i did end up seeing him post pictures of using stuff but he never said or tagged anything in it but i was one of the first people who saw the who saw the flipping power and asked Pizza back in the day and sent him a whole bunk, box of markers, paints, and all that sort of stuff. So that was pretty cool. So yeah, he's got all that stuff there. Oh my god, they look so great, man. They look so amazing. Again, when you when you see regular dudes wearing them and they look great, you already know it's a, it's a heavyweight shoe, man. You already know it's a heavyweight shoe. So if I'm not mistaken, most of them are already out of stock. Um okay, cool. It's called the that's what the models are called. It's called the new school V3. So let me see if they've got these on StockX and how much they're going for because I'm definitely going to try and buy a pair for myself because these look absolutely flames. Okay, sneakers and stuff allegedly still has them, which I don't think is true. I think that's a lie. Um, End is going to be stocking them very soon. Let's check what they're saying. And let's also see what StockX are saying because from what I've seen online, they're all out of stock everywhere. But let's see if StockX actually has a pair available. Yeah, 187. Oh, that's a lot, isn't it? But still, for what they are, and again, this is something that I think in general people don't do enough of. If you actually like something, especially if it's not that hyped, um, you shouldn't go based off the resale. Because I don't know who does this. Who buys shoes based off resale value? But I know some of them do. But if you actually like something, like you legitimately like it, buy it. Buy it. Just buy it if you like it. Buy it, rock it, make it a hot thing, turn it into the new Crocs, whatever it may be, buy it. Do yourself a favor. How much is it going for in a size 10? My size. UK. Let's see. Let's see what they're saying. Come on. You're not going to show me? You're not going to show me? There we go. Let's see. Let's see. What they're saying here. US 10. Oh, 185. Okay. For US 11. Not too bad then. It's a bit much to pay for a van. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's an amazing price. But still, for the sneaker that it is, it's pretty incredible. I'm not going to lie. How much did, How much do the Cheetah ones go for? Are they more expensive? We don't have the Cheetah ones, do we? No, we just have those. Let's see if we just put the search name in these and think and see if they come up. But I'm interested to see how much the cheetah ones go for as well in here. Do they have those available too, or is it just the the cheetah ones here? Let's see how much of those go the yellow. Because I've got a feeling they're gonna be a little bit more priced. I don't know why people seem to have this kind of hard on for cheetah print stuff, but oh okay, not really. 137 for the yellow ones. 
and let's see how much they go for on my size us 11 195 so yes about 10 pound more and then the black ones uh cheetah prints here as well let's see how much they go for in the us 11 those go for 185 so the standout colorway so far in my size is the cheetah here at the bottom but obviously i still think sorry that one here at the bottom but obviously i still think these ones the classics are definitely the best and again look how different that lacing is to the what i showed you about on from hypebeast and how these make them look terrible they don't actually make them look that great here but in the actual images that we saw earlier like those images they actually look way better that like that than they do like this so immediately these and the pictures that we saw that you know from the lookbook or from the editorial or wherever it may be called they look way better and make you want them and then these instantly look like you know anything look like any other vans whereas this actually makes them look different you clearly see there's a there's a there's a stuffed tongue you clearly see that the collar here has been somewhat widened you see the widened this you see it even gives you this illusion that the soul's thicker but i don't think it is do you know what i mean all those things are applicable there so they're available on stickers and stuff yeah they are actually still in a size four only though crazy and then on end they have available as well or is it due to launch oh, it's already launched it launched on the 21 so they're already out there they shouldn't be available if they're already launched no or am i bugging latest let's see what they say here uh come on brother okay let's just go to sorry let's go back to launches again and see what they're available but i don't think they are anyway from what i've seen they're all sold out literally everywhere um let's see launches let's scroll down and see if they got available uh, come on come on come on it's loading yeah so these are all gone the the reverse pandas they're calling them right oh no not pan what are they calling these they're calling these a uh, military blacks or something right um what else do they have available here do we see them here launch there launch yeah okay cool yeah so these were launched already and they're gone they should be gone Let's check um, and just in case. Yeah, but we don't see them anywhere available, so I'm pretty sure they probably end up going. But yeah, still an amazing shoe. Love everything about them. I did see the Vans Potato head thing at the back there, but definitely a standout shoe and definitely something that I think deserves more credit, especially for those abominations that we saw from Flipping Tiger and Mischief. Those are really, really sick. So check those out. If you do get a chance, check those out. Um, what else I need to talk about here quickly? Bish bash bosh. Oh, yeah, let's talk about this actually. Let's go from here. So, I'm sure most of you are aware this is already old news, but I just wanted to kind of highlight it because I think it's interesting to talk about in terms of why I think streetwear is one of the most exciting industries or scenes out there, especially for somebody who wants to maybe go into fashion and why I fell in love with streetwear from the moment I got into it many, many, many years ago. So, if I'm sure most of you are aware that Heron Preston. The guy obviously with a with the, with the brand of you know of his namesake did a collaboration with Bape recently, and he put out these uh, Bapesters with some clothing and stuff. We'll link to it, and it's really cool and interesting because it's a really cool and interesting story about Heron Preston and Bape and his history with sneakers in general. And he kind of highlighted it in this little video that he put up on his Instagram, which has been shared also on Twitter via the account that I follow, which I love, called Over and Under. And it says, and he kind of kind of speaks about the inspiration behind the Bapesters that he's put together and how it started from him making essentially bootlegs using the classic Air Force One mid in all white and then cutting out a Bapester um, star swoosh thing out of Gucci fabric and or Louis Vuitton fabric and then printing or pasting those onto the Air Force One similar to what uh, people used to do back in the day with Air Force Ones where they used to print or cut out real pieces of, of Gucci Louis Vuitton fabric and place it on the sides here in the UK what we used to have was we used to have this um, shop I forgot what it was called was it Global Sports or something else um, and Wiley was kind of famous for wearing them where they would airbrush a design on the swoosh or they take off the swoosh and put like a bandana print on it or something of those kind of lines. Those are really popular back in the day. And they were sold for many, for, you know, for hundreds and hundreds back in the day too. Um, especially considering, you know, what we kind of charge for those kind of things nowadays. But anyway, this is Heron Preston in his own words um, regarding his inspiration for doing the BAPE collaboration. Back in 2015, I introduced this project called The Street Sweepers, where I hacked an Air Force One and remixed it. And I called this like an impossible collaboration of three brands that would never, ever work together in a million years. Nike, Gucci, and Bape. I even relabeled the insole with the OG hair and Preston label before they were orange. And I even started to redesign the packaging and 
write my name on top of the logo. I didn't really like how that looked. I even started to write street sweepers, but then I started to stencil it. I even had these Gucci trimmers in here, which are little scissors that could trim the side of the Gucci fabric when they would start to fray. But a couple years later, after 2015, Babe hit me up and invited me to do an official collaboration, right? So that's what informed the logo on the box. And this is actually a pair of samples here, you see. I didn't like the stitching here, so I switched it up to more tonal stitching. But that's what informed this whole entire project. It started off with the Street Sweepers back in 2015. And the funny thing is, this inspiration or this model or this idea should have happened long, long time ago. But the fact that they had to wait for somebody else to do something cool before they jumped on it says everything about where, you know, the dire straits that Bape is in. Now, ever since Nigo was essentially booted out and kicked out of his own company and made to sell it for peanuts, this brand has been completely dying. And it's really sad for me because I'm an OG Bape fan. One of the first brands I bought when I first got into streetwear was obviously Supreme. No, was Bobby, was Hundreds, sorry, Bobby Hundreds, was the Hundreds, Bape and Supreme. Those are the three brands I copped. I didn't even cop Stushi at the time. I think Stushi came later after the fact that I was really getting into streetwear, which is really weird. I think Stussy might have even come after Obey. Absolutely redacted how I got there, but still, my introduction to streetwear was the Hundreds, Bape and Supreme. But when I found Bape, it also kind of opened my eyes to everything concerning that side of fashion in terms of uh, J J Japan streetwear, um, you know, Tokyo, the Urahara scene, all that sort of stuff, Harajuku, like amazing stuff, right? I've got magazines here stacked full of old school magazines from, from Japan, from yesteryears that focused on streetwear and all that sort of cool stuff. And obviously my heroes in that scene, Hiroshi Fujiwara, Nigo, Tetsu, Shin, all those amazing dudes i really set the precedent set the ground for what we have going forward but the interesting thing i think about a hair and president collaboration for me personally as an outsider and somebody also who's kind of known him from afar um and as a fan and somebody just kind of looking at it from as an observer because a few many many years ago it might have been like 2015 maybe 2013 i went to new york and um i actually met up with heron Preston. this was back when he used to do his blog that everyone was always checking out and he used to kind of document his time going to parsons university uh doing cool projects running around the city working in restaurants bumping into cool people it, it was basically like an instagram feed of a blog right but everyone used to check it out and he was really cool in terms of like putting himself out there and i think he was the one person who kind of allowed or kind of showed me what you had to do to kind of make it because i think being in london the kind of the kind of model yeah so being in london the kind of yeah sorry being in london did i show the video i think i probably showed it being in london the model that we obviously saw being in london was that in order to be cool here or in order to kind of get a cool job you kind of had to be how do you say you kind of had to be plugged in with the right people it wasn't really about your work it was always about who you were standing next to, which I never really liked because I'm not really somebody that was ever comfortable with getting down on my knees and sucking anyone's dick, right? Especially, you know, when it comes to stuff like shooting, when I knew my heroes and people that I was trying to aim to kind of get to and the level I wanted to be on was the Negos and the Roshi Fujiwaras of this world. And they were just doing the work and kind of putting dope shit out there and just continuing and rolling forward that way. I didn't need to have some marketing manager or flipping uh, seeding person telling me I had to pay my dues, which kind of obviously, you know, I think ended up costing to me a lot of things and end up probably shooting myself in the foot with a lot of stuff with how I spoke and how I carried myself and it probably didn't do me any favors and I didn't with any friends and maybe now at the moment I'm kind of isolated from it and watch it from the outside is all because of that but regardless you know you make a decision you have to live with it as a man it is what it is but when I saw him pressing doing this thing what I realized is that no you can do two things at the same time you can put out the work I think at the time he was also doing that book that he did about downtown what was it called where he took pictures of all his friends and whatever. Remember that pink book? I forgot what it was called. He was around that time he was doing that stuff. He also did that influential, you know, flipping uh, memorable interview with Heron, with Aaron Bondroff, him standing in front of some blind, some grills or whatever, talking about his inspiration, how he's coming up and what he's doing and whatnot. But what he proved was that you can do two things at the same time. You can be a social climber, a kind of smoocher, whatever it may be called. And you could also put out great stuff and show that you have the ability to, you know, uh, put your ideas into action like ship your ideas because everyone's got PSD files everyone's got PDFs everyone's got you know these fanciful ideas they want to do but rarely do people actually put their money where their mouth is print t-shirts like he did with the Gucci thing um Remember he did that white Gucci t-shirt, all these kind of cool projects he did on the side. And even when he was starting the Heron Preston brand, it kind of started mostly as a kind of conceptual art project. It kind of seemed like he was copying or going down the lane of, of, of what Tom Sachs was doing, where he does, where he does like um, interesting projects that, you know, that kind of uh, blend different genres. It could be sculpture, it could be art, 
It could be furniture, it could be installations, it could be performance art, publishing, clothing, all this sort of stuff are all in one. And obviously it landed here, it was supreme. But you obviously done the work and shipped. But the other interesting thing I think about this Heron Preston story when it comes to Bape is that to me growing up or to me being part of the scene and seeing it from afar, he was never the fashion guy. He was never the cool looking guy in clothes. He was never the sneaker guy, even though back in the day, he was always known for having really cool sneakers because like me, he was also around the time when cool sneakers were sold. And because he just didn't sell none of his shoes and he kind of moved on, he wasn't that interested in sneakers anymore. When he looked back at his collection, he was like, wow, I've actually got some sick stuff here. Right. And I think he, did, he showed it already before. Right. He's going to sell some stuff on eBay. He's got some really great stuff like old Jordan 5s old Air Force One, Kojo JP, Nikes, like crazy stuff his collection because he's buying the same time that I was buying it. But obviously I, myself, I ended up selling most of my stuff. He ended up keeping most of his stuff. But he was never the cool clothing guy. He was always, I think, the more so the cool idea guy, the dot connector, the, you would call him the communicator, right? Being able to communicate things. That's what probably he ended up doing some cool work with Yeezy, cool work with Kanye and all that sort of stuff. And with Virgil, like, yo, I think, that's maybe where his talent comes from that kind of ideation be able to tell a story through clothing all that sort of stuff but you never really saw him as a fashion guy which is what makes this achievement and this collaboration that much better even though i think the final product isn't that great i still think what it represents is far better than the actual product itself because what we have available in that collection is a classic bape head t-shirt with the star iron of it which is you know say la vie the t-shirt i don't know about the shape and stuff it's something that you have to kind of see in real life the shark hoodie i've always been a fan of the class again i come from you know shopping at the busy workshop store in upper james street i'm a person that was trying to back in the day find any picture that i could of the old nowhere shop that um nigo and jun takahashi used to run back in the day from undercover and nowadays that picture's everywhere honestly you can only you couldn't find even images of the inside of nowhere nowadays you've got hd pictures of this stuff all over the place but when i was buying bape the only shark hoodies that ever mattered was the olive green and the gray that was it. And maybe some colours here and there. Red. I remember he's seeing purple here and there. But block colours. Whenever they started including camos and prints in it, that's when I had to back out. Especially when they started doing, when, when Flipping Bape was sold to IT, the shark motif got completely devalued when they started to print it on shorts and and sweatpants and jeans and stuff and socks. Like, get the hell out of here. So me seeing, number one, a shark hoodie in camo, and not just one camo, two types of camo, You've got the classic olive kind of whatever camo that is in the brown and greens. And then you've got a purple blue camo. And then you've got a screen printed bape on the front of it with the hair and pressing again. Awful. Awful, awful, awful. Awful as a piece. Really, really bad, right? Then And, then, and again, how many logos do you need? You've got the front bape stuff thing here you've got the hair and pressing underneath the thing then on the sleeves you've got the star then you've got the the classic target mark on all um bape shark hoodies that had it there and then you've also got the other orange label with the bape head and the hair and press on the side it's like so it's, it's overkill whereas i think the nicest thing in it, so actually the plainest thing is this and I think this actually suits Hair and Preston as a brand. If you think about Hair and Preston being, you know, starting from workwear and utility wear and all that sort of stuff. This sort of stuff is really, I think, really kind of speaks to the six. No, it's probably the best standout things in this collection, or this collaboration. And what it is, is the camo workers jacket and also the camo workers pant. Because essentially, this is like a double knee pant, which, you know, you would say Hair and Preston's kind of known for ma making those utility pants and that sort of stuff. And he's also, I think, personally known for wearing these kind of work jackets that he kind of wears into the ground, picks them up vintage, and then maybe kind of iterates it out into his own brand. And I think this is really well done. It's essentially a classic work jacket with some great little pockets hidden there on the front. You've got nice uh, front big pockets here as well, which I always love. I'm always a big advocate of the... Uh, Rick Owens uh, methodology when it comes to putting jackets together he always kind of come through it from the point of view of the jacket pockets always need to be big enough to carry a book and a, and a sandwich because you don't really see um, even in a as a brand Rick Owens there isn't necessarily like a side bag or like a satchel or whatever a lot of people carry the tote that sometimes you get if you shop in Rick Owens or sometimes they carry big bags but there's not really like a side bag a crouchement sort of swing usually the outerwear or the jackets the outerwear, the jackets, the pants, they always have big enough pockets to put a smartphone, a digital camera, 
some book, you, some Dostoevsky book you've been reading, uh, a sandwich or whatever it may be. And I love that these jackets have the same sort of thing. So a, a, a pocket big enough for a book and another pocket enough, big enough to put like a sandwich in it or whatnot. And then the pants are also fairly decent too. I love the label here and the waistband. I thought that's a really nice detail. Again, you can't see anything up front, but I think the shape is probably going to be quite cool. You've got this double knee feature here, reinforced, obviously taking inspiration from, you know, utility pants like from Dickies and Carhartt and whatnot. And I think these are kind of say a lot about it overall but what i wanted to make this point about was that i think the hair impression story should be inspiration for most kids going forward especially kids who want to get into fashion because i never saw hair impression as a stylish dude i still don't think he's someone that you know in dresses entirely that well but i think his ideas applied in streetwear and then kind of superimposed through a fashion lens really work nowadays because essentially everybody wears streetwear in one way shape or form even though people like Vanessa Friedman's and all these you know glitzy flipping fashion journalists will always try and dog whistle us and say the return of tailoring is coming back which is essentially saying they want all the black and brown people to get out of their scene streetwear has been running it from day dot it's still running it now you see the work that Virgil's been doing RIP you see what Matthew Williams is doing at Givenchy he's basically single-handedly brought them back into relevance we like it or lump it with the stuff that he's doing there you see what Kim Jones is doing at Dior obviously his history comes from streetwear all of these people have been grounded in that school and I think the reason why is because you're allowed to ideate in a way that probably you couldn't in fashion you're allowed just to kind of put your ideas forth and sometimes because these brands are so hungry for the hype they might latch on to you asking for a collab and then that creases your profile and then suddenly you go from a guy that just prints t-shirts and makes your own clothing to suddenly have a collaboration with one of the biggest and longest storied brands in the, in the scene even though they're not what they used to be so I think if you want to get into fashion an actual clever way to get into it to kind of backdoor your way into it forget going to fashion school unless you want to learn pattern cutting and unless you want that connection unless you want to be taught by a very esteemed you know lecturer whatever it may be start a streetwear brand actually start making clothes think of different ideas you know deconstruct a hoodie make a perfect hoodie that what kanye has been on the mission to do with gap make your perfect sweatpants, make your perfect coach jacket, whatever. Take the staples of streetwear, the baseball cap, the hoodie, the t-shirt, the long sleeve, the denim pants, the jeans, the, the chino pants, the shorts in the summer, the vest, the down jackets, all those classic pieces in streetwear, the baseball cap, the trucker hat, the dad hat, the beanie, and just reinterpret them in your own way and that would be a better way to get into fashion in the back doorway than would be to start in the fashion ten terms of things and be kind of pontificating about the cut of a pant about the pleat of this about this and that don't care capture the zeitgeist as heron preston did and actually capture kids imagination and then you never know sky is that's definitely the limit because i never saw this happening for heron preston because again like i said the heron preston i knew was never cool in terms of clothes he was cool as a person in terms of what he did who he knew how he presented presented the you know the stuff that he was into and on his blog and so i even i remember the time even my blog back in the day i think i even copied the layout of it if i'm not mistaken i think if i can find it let me see if i can find my old blog let me go on. Is it, uh, is it, was it, was it, what is it called again? Is it Wayback Machine, right? Wayback Machine. Let me see, because I remember back in the day, I even copied how like my layout of my blog was from the whole hair and press and things. And you'll be able to see it now. Once I get it up on here, you'll be able to see, you'll be like, oh yeah, if, if you read that blog back in the day, you'll know straight away what I mean here. Uh, let me get it up on here. So let me do this. Let me take that away. And let me do Agostino. Let me do Agostino.co.uk. That was my old blog back in the day, right? Mad. And I gave it up as well, that flipping URL. I'm pretty sure URL has been taken now anyway, isn't it? Right, let's see if it's still there. Agostino.co.uk. Let's see who's got that URL right now. Who's got it right now? Okay, no one. So anyway, um, this URL was this, right? And I'm pretty sure if I go to 2010, let me see here, Wayback Machine. I'm pretty sure you'll be able to see that my blog looked very similar to what Mr. Heron was doing back then. Let's see if I can get this up. Um, bear with me a second. Bear with me a second. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, look, see? If you knew this blog back then, you would know how it was laid out. And mine was similar to this. He was similar to this layout-wise. Um, there was a banner here. Um, blocked H and you know, it was all HTML coding on the archive bit. Showing off all the posts you did back in the day. Look at the blog. I did it 2006 all the way up to there the big text the pictures on the side here the roll all this stuff look all the stuff i've got here on my blog um titles from february torres love agostino another one stoked with results now rock the jacket with pride 
DIY Titan. I got this stick jacket from Nike SB, Skate Metal 3-in-1, and it comes with patches so you can sew on. Been a minute since I used a bit of a needle thread. Quote of the day, Visions is back. I'm talking about loads of stuff on here. My top picks on Men's Fashion Week. Crazy. Sportswear design, like all this stuff came from there. So it's really cool to see where he's kind of got in his career and stuff in terms of what he's been able to do. Um, and then let's play the video here to end it, and then we're going to continue. The video from his... Uh, Jeans are overkill with the logos, man. Too much, man. The t-shirt's nice, though. Good song. The thing is, it's interesting too about kids nowadays. I think I think they actually like, that's maybe the reason why. So even though I'm cr criticizing this, I think they like this over logo, oh, um, this over logification of clothing. Because back in the day, I remember one of the signs that you knew a brand was dying was when it got popular and it suddenly started to bang its logo everywhere in front of everything. Usually the shapes of everything you would sell it. Supreme is even a good example. Supreme back in the day, you know the little tag they've got on their sh clothing, the little Supreme red tag. Sometimes on their clothes, they'd make it, it'll be tonal. So if you had like an olive jacket, it'd be a t olive like hang, like little tag underneath the, the hem, whatever, or the, or the seam, whatever it may be, right? Nowadays, that could never happen. It's always got to be red. And if it's not red, there'll be like a other thing that says Supreme on the sleeve or the shorts, even if they've decided to change. But back in the day, you could tell someone was wearing a Supreme coach jacket just from the shape, just from how the buttons were placed, whatever it may be. But now they have to let you know, no, this is Supreme. No, 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 it's Supreme. It's Supreme, it's Supreme, it's Supreme, it's Supreme. And I think maybe the kids sort of like this sort of stuff, but I, I can't imagine being okay with walking down the street and legitimately being like a walking billboard. Don't get me wrong, this t-shirt is cool. I think t-shirts are one thing, whatever. When it comes to jackets and stuff, like even the jeans I saw at the back, the jeans that I said, or the pants I said were, were not too bad. No, actually, so there's sweatpants all included. There's sweatpants included and they've got not only the logo on the front, they've also got a logo in the flipping butt cheeks. It's like, how much logos can you have, bruv? Like, look at that. So, so, so those are the double knee pants. The double knee pants I actually like. I actually have vape at the back of the bum with hair and presser. Like, so you, you know what I mean? You're literally riding hair and presser's bum, which is absolutely maddening. But hey, I mean, like, I think it's just too much. And as a shark hoodie too, the shark hoodie should be either in camo, one color, olive or gray. All this pattern stuff with the with the screen print, that's just too much overkill for me anyway, personally. That work jacket is still fire, don't get me wrong. And the models make it look extra cool because they're all cool looking, especially with the music and the background and stuff. But it's just super overkill. Like, it's just enough. Too much, man. But anyway, regardless, congratulations to him. And like I said, get involved in streetwear. Sky's the limit in that way. Don't go to the fashion side of things. It's boring. And you could do way more interesting and cool stuff, I think, if you angle it around the streetwear side of things. But again, what do I know? Next, we want to move on quickly to news that just happened actually the other day, or just today actually. Balenciaga hosted their show in New York, in the uh, New York Stock Exchange. Actually, they shut it down. The clothes I thought were fairly cool looking. Loads of kind of gimp inspired uh, streetwear clothing, you would say. Some people in my fashion circles on the timeline aren't too happy with it because they think it's a bit redundant. Um, they think it's a bit samey. That some of them are accusing it of being a cash grab, but in my opinion, I disagree. I think all fashion is a cash grab in the end because essentially it is, um, you know, it's flipping a uh, commercialization, right, of fashion, right? It's, it's, it's capitalism. When you see collaborations coming out nowadays, it's rarely because of two brands that love and honor exactly what they do. It's rarely a relationship with people who like what each other does. You know, back in the day in street, whatever collaboration will happen, they'll be like, yeah, man, I only collaborate with people that I know, people that I love. He or she's my brother, they're my sister. You never hear that about collaborations in streetwear or in fashion anymore. It's always collaboration out of convenience. It's always, oh, what can you do for me? What can you bring to the table for me? What fans do I need to add to my Rolodex? How's my boss? bottom line how can you help me with that sort of stuff that's all it is so to pinpoint balenciaga say they do anything different anybody else is not do you think flipping gucci has an aff affinity with the north face or do you think gucci knew that the north face has a very hyper active 
and also, you know, willing to, you know, an audience that has a lot of disposable income because they buy noopsies at retail for like 230 already. So to go up, to jump up and buy a noopsie for 700 or 400 isn't that big of a jump if you're already going to spend two. So why not try and capture them and also leave an imprint so maybe the kids that do buy that Gucci and, and North Face stuff might end up then saying, you know what, let me check out what, which, um, what this guy is doing for Gucci of Ruin, the mainline runway stuff and go buy that. So it's always, always about what can you do for me and let, less about the love. So what Blinch Shelga are doing here with this Adidas collaboration that's currently on the screen isn't anything diff different than any other brand is doing but for some reason they seem to get more the hate than everybody else so everyone's voting on here I'm going to say the vote on here from Outlander magazine says who did it better Balenciaga Adidas or Gucci Adidas let's take a look let's take a look at the picks first of all before I make my vote live on the podcast so the Adidas collaboration with Balenciaga is pretty standard but what I do like about it is that they've taken the logo that is more applicable to the European market, especially Eastern and Central Europe. The logo with the three sort of rectangular bricks slanted. That's the classic logo you see in most places, especially if you go to places like where I went, uh, Czech Republic. You go to Prague, just a bit outside where all the actual hood people live and you see them wearing tracksuits all with the sort of logo on it you go to pay, obviously places like berlin and stuff you you see all the cool kids that go to techno clubs wearing adidas shorts with that logo with their dr martins on so that clearly is something that a lot of people like to wear and it's obviously done in a big oversized way and the other thing that he's done that's pretty clever loads of tracksuits plain ones with the stripes classic classic adidas sort of wear so instead of going and doing the hyper performance sort of stuff it's taking stuff from the archives stuff that you would generally buy in a, in a vintage stop like an oversized jumper a pullover a pair of, pair of sweatpants and it just applied the kind of balenciaga dna and codes to it and i think for me this is far more wearable in my day-to-day -day and what I'm into. And I think for the majority of the public than the stuff that you saw from Gucci and Adidas. I think that Gucci and Adidas is a little bit more fashion is my passion, especially those loafers with the free shots on the side. Like you've got to be a real dedicated fashionista to wear those and not feel like an absolute wallad. Whereas the gazelles look really nice and I think they'll probably appeal to the general public. But I think outside of that, if you told me what actual fashion people would want to wear in their wardrobe day-to-day -day, if they weren't being recorded and they had to put out a you know, a somewhat cool and controversial comment, I think it'll be a Balenciaga one. This fits into most people's wardrobe, I think, personally, for me. And I like most of it too. And the bags look absolutely incredible. And obviously, the finishing touches, that gimp mask there at the top with the little extensions at the top looks amazing. And of course, those boots, which I'm going to speak about later. But I would say the Balenciaga and Gucci stuff looks way more better. Sorry, the Balenciaga and Adidas stuff looks way more better. And of course, if I vote on here, I'm pretty sure people say Adidas. Yeah, see? Adidas, of course, because Adidas and Gucci, because people are um, not fans of Balenciaga and feel like it's a little bit redundant, a little bit samey over the last few years. But I don't agree personally. I think it looks sick. But anyway, and obviously there's some uh, detailed pictures here too. Obviously, quickly move on to that. It shows a track jacket with the tray foil logo, I guess that's called, right? The little kind of weed lo logo motif sort of looking thing. We've got another jacket here, no, another hoodie, pullover hoodie that I'm sure is going to look amazing on in terms of shape with um, the trifeg logo, trifoil, whatever it's called, and then Balenciaga written underneath. Um, and then you've got another jacket that's quite nice, or hoodie, sorry. That's essentially a pullover, which is a bit more retro looking in terms of its shape, color blocking under the armpits, uh, black body, and then uh, the stripes going down the sleeves. I like that look as well. And then we've got another interesting collaboration here, which is taking the Balenciaga Triple S, the much maligned Triple S, the much disrespected Triple S, and place some stripes on the side of them, which I'm not too fond of, to be honest, looking at them. I much prefer the classic Balenciaga Triple S. And then there's a picture here of ASAP Nast wearing um, some Balenciaga outfits there. But... The main story to come out of this, for me personally, the main story has to be these boots that were debuted in that runway collection that Kanye ended up wearing before anybody else, naturally. These boots were legitimately made for Kanye. Like, they were made for him. And I think I've actually got a video here taken from the runway where Kanye is sitting down, I think, next to Pharrell. And he's, like, pointing and saying, look, you see my influence? You see what I've gone? You see the effect I have on these people? Let me see if I get a video up on here. Uh, yeah, here it is. There's a video of, of, of Kanye on the front row. Let me actually get the, the sound playing um, at the Balenciaga show as the models are walking down and he's, you know, nudges somebody and says, you know, look at that. I think he's, because they're basically wearing the boots that he has on. It's an incredible little scene here. See? See my influence? It looks so good. Amazing. Um, and honestly, these are my perfect boot. These legitimately give me a boner, give me a hard on, and I want them instantly. 
they obviously, I'm assuming, going to be rubber. So they look heavy. They look a bit bulbous and stuff, but they're probably going to be made out of the same rubber that they've made the other boots that you saw Isab Nas wearing. And then obviously the croc boots that they made. So it's maybe a similar type of leather to that thing. So they may not be the most breathable le shoes in the world. They might not end up being the most comfortable. But in terms of a look, I love them. I legitimately love them. I've always been a big fan of big boots. I usually wear my big boots like this with skinnier jeans. It wouldn't be such straight looking jeans like this, but I think maybe this sort of straight style of a jean probably suits it a little bit better, especially if you're going to stuff the, the, the trousers into the jeans itself. Um, obviously him wearing the classic Balenciaga jacket that he's been absolutely living in. It's the same jacket. See, it's actually been worn down that much. This is, this is actually a good thing that Kanye's got this wardrobe now that he uses all the time this black wardrobe which mainly balenciaga pieces and some of his stuff he's obviously done with balenciaga and gap but i like the fact that he's been wearing this leather bomber jacket for ages to the point where he's worn it down where the logo is actually disappearing the logo that they kind of embossed onto the actual leather itself is kind of fading away the white font is kind of going away from it and he's got this exaggerated long tee which is obviously a classic thing that everyone does with bomber jackets where bomber jackets with an incredibly long tee but i do like how he's broken up the colors with these kind of grayish kind of jeans in the middle here plus the boots itself but i think the boots themselves are amazing legitimately one of the most amazing things i saw on the runway it's definitely something that i can't wait to go pick up themselves this is an article courtesy of Vogue says yay wore Blenciaga's XXL boots before they even hit the runway so is that what they're called XXL boots um Earlier today, Balenciaga hosted this resort 2023 show inside New York Stock Exchange. Pharrell Williams, Offset, and Alex Demi were there, but it was rapper Kanye West, or Ye as he's known now, who made a paparazzi and the fellow showgoers go wild. West's appearance at the show was no surprise, given he's often partnered with Balenciaga's Demna. West almost exclusively wears designs these days, not to mention he also worked with the designer on a number of custom looks for his ex-wife um, ex Kim. Um, to, take the, to take in the show, the rapper wore a layered look that included signature pieces of black leather bomber jacket, brown hoodie, is that brown or black? It looks black to me. Or maybe it's brown. Um, the, the signature pieces, the, the long tee, black jeans and the monstrously large boots with, were featured in the show. Ye could easily have walked the runway today, which included many similar ensembles. It's aesthetic that Ye has in cultivated over the years. Okay, no info about the shoes. They're just talking shit and waffling. But the boots are absolutely incredible. And what they reminded me of, oddly enough, were these shoes. I think they're from 2017 or 2014. I've got the years. Is it 2017? I'm not sure of my Raph Simmons, um, you know, chronology. But basically, these boots, bunny boots that came out from Raph Simmons back in the day that were I think for most Raph Simmons fans are a grail um they're definitely up there in terms of boots that everyone wants to get and they're from what I've heard from people they're you know, incredibly comfortable and I think these are a really good sort of like um evolution of that in terms of the look overall and personally I think they look way better these Balenciaga boots look in my opinion a lot better than those um Raph Simmons boots in terms of everyday wear I think again there is a thing I always use, say the phrase that most people talk about, passion for fashion, but I think these look more passion for fashion e than these boots. Because essentially what these Balenciaga exaggerated boots are, these XSL boots, is they're basically a classic take on the classic combat boot that you would maybe get from Dr. Martins or any other, you know, nondescript military combat brand. And if you if I'm not mistaken, also, Balenciaga's always done a really good combat boot like standard like what's the boot that they made that i've always loved um Balen oh, what was it called again balenciaga boots right it's like a i forgot the name of it it's like a tracker it's not a tracker they've got a really nice one that they make yeah that's the one uh tractor that's the one balenciaga tractor boot right so they've always made really great boots i think overall um especially when you consider you know Demna, he, he he always used to rock New Rock boots, um, considering where he's from, Eastern Central Europe, considering the scene he's kind of come from, you know, techno, dance music, all that sort of stuff, considering what he's associated with Berlin, all that, it, it makes sense why they'd make good boots, but they, in my opinion, they've always made really decent, decent looking boots, if you think back to the stuff that they did here, um, these kind of tractory looking boots, I forgot the ones I'm trying to look for, yeah, some like these... The Bulldozer are ones are a good example that came out recently, but there's another one that I'm thinking of, which has got like a lace at the front, which is similar to maybe to these. It's got like the kind of uh, the stitching here in the front of the toe box, but they've always made a really decent lace up boot, in my opinion. Like, really, really great, like classic sort of style. Even when he was at Veteran there's always a really nice lace up boot that they put together over there. So, it's no surprise that he's able to take that and be able to apply it to this and make this exaggerated form of this kind of shoe. And let me tell you, I think these are going to be way more popular, in my opinion, than the Balenciaga Crocs 
that obviously Kanye made famous and was wearing for forever. He was he couldn't take those things off. I think they're going to be way more famous and way more way more well received than these uh, Balenciaga. What are they called? Uh, there they are. Um, those EVR rain boots, EVA, sorry, rain boots. I think you're going to see those boots that I just showed you on screen. These ones, the lace up ones, way, be worn way more than these, in my opinion. They're going to be everywhere. These are going to be everywhere. And most likely, you're going to see them copied and faked by loads of different brands from the Sheens to the ASOS to the flipping whatever else out there they're going to do their dress into it. Because I think this might end up being like the Balenciaga version of the Bottega Veneta um, puddle boots, right? Bottega, was it? Bottega Veneta Puddle Boots, right? I think they're going to end up being similar to these. Way, way similar in terms of looks and stuff, like people catting them and doing their own iteration. You're definitely going to see them because we already saw, you know, um, what's, it, what's it called? Ambush, basically making a copy of these, which were horrible, right? Balenci ambush Puddle Boots. No shame, absolutely no shame in that game taking the exact same thing and making their copy of it. So you're definitely going to see brands do the same thing when it comes to these shoes going forward. Honestly, they're so good. I can't wait to get my pair. I'm definitely, definitely getting the same way how I how, how I jumped on the Blenciaga Triple S in the black and red. And unfortunately, I had to throw them away because during the pandemic, I naively, like an idiot, didn't put a gel pack in the box. And when I went to try and wear them one day to go out, the whole missile was breaking. Absolutely shocking. Absolutely hurtful, especially considering how much I paid for them. But I'm definitely going to try and get a pair of these, man. They look absolutely amazing cartoonishly and freakishly big i can't wait to wear them i love marmite shoes by the way i'm a big fan of Marmite, especially when it comes to boots marmite boots especially black ones i'm always gonna wear them always gonna wear them anyway that is the Axiom Ding Show episode number 389 thank you so much for tuning in been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if the first time checking out the show and you like what you hear smash like you know click subscribe if you want to check out the channel if you listen via the podcast app of course leave me a review and share it with all your family and friends there's currently a patreon episode out at the moment another one coming out tomorrow bonus episode you can check out i do those once per week so check that out if you want if need be and also that's about it really for a minute no that's it also yeah that's it but yeah thanks so much for tuning in but a pleasure to have for your company hope you have a great start of the week and we continue doing what we need to do and obviously if you listen to the audio podcast you'll hear a song if you're watching it via youtube you won't hear anything just it fade to black peace <laughs>